All right, here's my question. When and if we finally know for sure that there are aliens, how is that going to happen? What does that look like? What, what, how do you think that moment is going to unfold? It's going to be a text message to a few people in California, I think, because they have this dedicated array there. They are constantly listening. There are people all over the world with their radio telescopes just listening to see if they can hear anything that sounds like it's been created. Like a tech, we call it a techno signature. It could be an image like this in, in binary. Um, it could be the digits of pi in a radio wave. If they hear that, then there's these all these automatic algorithms that are like, hey, this looks weird. This definitely looks like it's 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 alien made. And it's gonna automatically alert these people and they're gonna get a message and they, they literally get on a plane and get to the telescope and they're like, okay, we need to check this. Was that actually your microwave? Or was that your mobile phone? And then they have to have this really hard conversation of how do we tell the public without panicking them? <laughs> so you think it will be a signal, like an intelligent signal. You don't think it'll be a biosignature in an exoplanet or something else. You think you think the moment will be that kind of that Jodie Foster moment in contact. I think we're going to have many moments over the next 50 years, I would say. I think biosignatures I think will happen and that's a separate a separate way of searching, looking, for example, under the icy moons of Jupiter and, and Saturn. I think people will get excited. It'll be front page news. People will say, well, did we come from space? You know, on, on a, an asteroid, there are people looking for amino acids on asteroids. That's going to be a moment. But the moment when we realise we are not alone in terms of intelligence, in terms of curiosity and the ability to possibly even talk to a different civilization that's going to be an existential crisis for the whole of humanity and i'm not sure i want to be there for that <laughs> actually um, i i love this field i love researching it but i kind of almost don't want to know the answer because i'm not sure humans are going to deal with it very well do you want to know what brady thinks i want to know what brady thinks brady what no, do you think no it doesn't matter what brady thinks because the video is <laughs> about me but i'm going to tell you what i think i think it's going to be a gradual drip 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 of press releases and things like that, that it's maybe this, maybe that, it could be, could be. And I think by the time we get to the point where we believe it's real, we're going to be so inoculated Jaded. that it's going to be like, oh, yeah, it turns out there are aliens out there and this is where they live on this exoplanet really far away. I disagree. I don't think it's going to be the existential <laughs> crisis you think. I think people are going to be like, by the time we confirm it, I think it's going to be meh. And I, I think that there's going to be an element of that because extraterrestrials are so woven into our society and our science fiction and our books and everything. There's all these different types. So I, I think that that realisation isn't going to be so hard. But I think that because our telescopes now, the, the, the way we're searching is so uh, sensitive that I... Th Unlike, for example, my work in cosmology, where we're looking for this tiny unknown signal under a huge amount of rubbish, and we're gonna, and that's gonna be 10 years of like, was that a signal of a first star? I really think that, for example, with the square kilometer array, we switch that on in a few years, we're going to be able to hear the equivalent of an airport radar on a planet 10 light years away, very easily. And so there really is the chance here that that it's something like the digits of pi that is a universal number and will get sent out and it will be really quite clear. There are quite a few ways of, of checking this signal very quickly by, for example, looking at the planet and then looking away. Is it still there? I just think in the immediate news cycle and the, our need for immediacy these days, the fact we're not going to be able to communicate with them. Yes. And it will just be, oh yeah, there's a signal there, there's something going on there, but we can't talk with them for another 500 years. I think people will just be like, well, it's not my problem. I agree with you. I think, I think there's going to be a very quick panic of kind of, oh my gosh, are they going to come? And then hopefully the scientists will be on it enough to communicate. Science communication is very important in this, that they're not going to arrive here. So to, to be very clear, anybody in SETI with any credibility doesn't believe that aliens have visited ever. 
um, and the, 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 all the UFO sightings, that's, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not credible. Um, and if we, if we do start to communicate with these, the, the next terrestrial intelligence, they could be 50 light years away or 100 light years away. And so the signal will take 100 years to get there and 100 years to get back. And you're right, people don't really care to plant a tree that they're never going to sit under, especially politicians. They care about a five year cycle, right? Let me ask you this. You're like a proper astronomer, right? You do, you, you do, you know, you write papers, you do research on, uh, you know, early stars and things like that. You also have this incredible passion and enthusiasm for SETI and the search for extraterrestrial life. In the astronomical community, are the people who also have this passion for SETI considered like a different class or are they like, is there, are they like? Yeah, there's some eye rolling. Um, yeah, I wasn't into SETI at all until about two years ago and I almost considered it kind of a bit of the, the fringe area and it was only when I went research into it myself that I realised that actually they're really pushing the boundary of technology and science and the ability to filter signals and search for signals and the computing power they need of incredible stuff. When I have mentioned to people that, oh yeah, I'm running a SETI project with the undergraduates, there's kind of like, oh, that's fun. It's not really it's not really seen so seriously. I think the biosignatures side is taken very seriously. So looking for for biosignatures in exoplanet atmospheres, there's a fascinating area and really depressing area where they're looking for signs of climate change in exoplanet atmospheres. So they're like, hey, has any civilization destroyed themselves in a similar way to us? <laughs> Because I speak to lots of astronomers and I know lots of astronomers and in much the same way I think astronomers have to say, have to say hey it's not about like astrology and star science right you know that's you've got it wrong. I also think sometimes they feel a little bit like no I'm not searching for aliens it's not about aliens that's not what astronomy is. Yep. But you are a fully fledged <laughs> astronomer, but you are also really into searching for aliens and that sort of thing. So I wonder, are you considered like a, a crazy auntie or is there more acceptance within the community I, that this is legit? Or? I think there's definitely a raised eyebrow at my kookiness <laughs> when it comes to doing this as a, as a side project. Um, I fight very hard for the reputation to be to be repaired. This was considered a really crucial scientific area in the 1970s. And it was only when the politicians got involved and start saying, we can't use our taxpayers' money to search for aliens, and it became a political football. But like I said, the science that I have to do, I'm looking at how a message is gravitationally lensed around the sun. For example, that's gravitational lensing. We've talked about that before. I'm looking at information loss and all sorts of techniques that actually I use in my search for the first star. So this is it. I was in um, a control room of a radio telescope in California a few years ago and they were showing me this image of this drift signal where it turns off and on, like the signal that we're looking for. And I saw them type in and they were like, oh yeah, we're just going to use this thing to search for a signal. I was like, wait. I use that. That was developed by my first stars team with LOFAR, my radio telescope in the Netherlands. And I was like, hang on, I'm searching for a signal from the first stars that's tiny, we don't know where it's coming from, what it's going to look like, and it's got a load of rubbish on top of it. That's the same as searching for an alien signal. And so it just, it, I just switched on, I was like, I can just use these techniques. And my answer to anybody who kind of raises an eyebrow, I was like, why not? Why wouldn't you do this? while you're doing your other science. And that's what SETI has built itself up around, thanks to all of this political funding cuts, is they've become what was originally called like parasitic SETI, where they developed all this technology that was kind of plug and play, and they shipped it to Australia, to Lovell, Manchester, and they plugged it in. And while they're searching for pulsars, they take that data, and they also sift through it with their techniques. And there's, there's a lot of that going on still. It's called Boutique SETI now, it's been rebranded. Why not? Why wouldn't you? And plus, you know, we're not actually taking taxpayer dollars to do this anymore because of all of these cuts. They were so clever and they created their own charities and their own institutes. And it's basically funded by billionaires with too much money and a will to put their name on everything, including first contact. Um, and, and they give they give hundreds of millions of dollars. Steven Spielberg has given $100,000 because he said it's about time that he invested in some science fact, which I thought was beautiful. Um, yeah, but it's, it's mostly Microsoft, Google, Hewlett Packard, um, all the big names fund this now, and just random Russian billionaires that you'll have never heard of. Humans love 
stories and humans love heroes. They love like the first person to put their footprint on the moon and things like that. Will First Contact have a hero? Will there be a person who happens to be on call at the time, like that moment when, you Jody know, Jodie Foster? Foster. Will, there, will there be a moment, is it like that anymore? Or will it, will there be a, a first person who heard it? I think there will, no, okay, so, very unlikely because uh, when Jodie Foster was looking in contact for anybody that doesn't know that film so much fun also a book by Carl Sagan yeah she was listening and, and heard it but and that was kind of you imagine your old radio if you had one <laughs> you tuned it into Radio 4 and you listened to Radio 4 that's all we used to be able to do now SETI is about having the most powerful servers in the world and they scan every single radio channel in incredibly fine detail over all of the bandwidth at the same time. A human doesn't listen to that. It's it's this algorithm. Will there be the first people that get that message, that automatic message? Yes, I think Jill Tarter, um, if it is within her lifetime, and I'm not saying anything about her age there because contact could very easily be in 102 years. Jill Tarter was one of the people that really kept SETI going during the funding cuts. She's incredible history. If it's her dedicated array that she helped build, she learned to fly so she could get to this remote location. I think she'd be the hero. You can't talk about the search for alien life without this thing that lots of people have heard of but might not understand called the Drake Equation. Can you tell me what the Drake Equation is? The Drake Equation, I'm going to quote Jill Tata and say it's an incredible way of organising our ignorance. It is a series of symbols, very apt for this channel, which was written on a chalkboard in 1961 by Frank Drake at the first ever meeting of minds on how do we search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And he brought together all the people interested in the world, which he said was about 10. And this included people like Carl Sagan, science communicator, but also someone who was researching how to talk to dolphins. And he was taking LSD and going in and talking to dolphins. But at the time, people thought he was serious. And because we want to know how do you communicate, so it's all of these different meetings minds it was like right what do we need to know to contact aliens and so he wrote this equation on the board and the left hand side is n and that is the number of intelligent extraterrestrial civilizations that we can contact and all of this is a bit tongue-in-cheek it's meant to be an agenda for a conference people get all excited and like let's calculate every bit it's not meant to be that it's meant to be this way of thinking so n is it possible then we go on to the right hand side and we're like, right, what do we need to know? First of all, how many stars are there? How many stars are there formed per year? And we're talking about, you know, a star formation rate where you've got maybe 10 stars a year formed in a particular, in the Milky Way. Um, it's very low. <laughs> I'm always surprised by that. Um, but you kind of need a star to, to create planets, to create life. So how many stars? Then we're going to filter. And I always think of this as kind of like when you're searching for clothes. On, on a big clothing website, you're like, right, size 12, red, skirt. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing here. We've got the number of stars, right. How many of those stars, what fraction of those are going to form a planet? Since Frank Drake's, Frank Drake's time, we've done so much research on exoplanets. So we're quite happy that that's, that's really high. It's, it's, it's one, basically all stars can form planets. Like there's very, very few that, that will, blow themselves up so quickly they can't form planets. So a fraction of those, one. It's really important not to get bogged down in the exact numbers here. It's more like, it's a philosophy. Yeah. Are there enough for us to keep searching on this filter on our website? Yeah, there's still a whole load of stuff in here, so let's keep looking. So that's what we're doing here. We're slowly filtering in every stage saying, is it worth looking? So are there you're looking for stars? Basically, you're looking for a deal breaker. Yeah, we are. We're yeah. looking for a deal breaker. The deal breaker isn't the number of stars. We're fine. Yeah. The deal breaker is not the number of planets. We're good. Then we're going to go on to how many of these planets actually form an ecosystem. So have an atmosphere that can protect them from the sun's rays, for example, um, and create an atmosphere that's, that's, that's breathable if, if those people have lungs. <laughs> um, and that's, again... 50%-ish, you know, we're, we're talking about a really large 30 to 50% kind of range of planets that might form this kind of atmosphere. But then how many of those can form life? Again, we're kind of like just balancing numbers here, but let's go 50% again, you know. Now we get to the deal breakers. How many of those planets, what fraction of those can form intelligent life? This is where we just don't have a clue. We've got a sample of one at the minute, but 
is there really any barrier to evolving intelligent life once you've started evolving life? Not really, it's more about time, isn't it? So let's keep going, let's keep going on to that. Now we've got intelligent life, what fraction of those can create a way of contact? How many of those develop, let's say, a radio telescope? So you're going to want an atmosphere that lets radio waves in. Uh, you're going to want a curious civilization. Um, at one point, somebody added a symbol to this equation that was like F. SP, which was the fraction of stupid politicians that you had on the planet, because even if you do develop these radio dishes, the politicians can pull the funding yeah. <laughs> at any point. And this is this is a bit of a deal breaker for me at this point. So the fraction that can create a communicative device and then sustain it takes a lot of power to to send out a message, and you don't know which planet to to, to point at. Um, so you, you're going to want a civilization that has huge energy budget as well. But we've done it. We've done it. Yeah. We have sent a message in the yeah. 1970s, that yeah. this one here. Yeah. Um, and we have been sending messages out since radio and TV began. This is actually called the I Love Lucy radius, um, because I Love Lucy was the first mass-produced sitcom where everybody was listening and it went everywhere on every radio bro um, TV broadcast. And so that radius is running at about 70 light years. So if you are within 70 light years of Earth, you can probably tune into I Love Lucy <laughs> and know we're here, um, though it would be quite faint. Last one, and this is the bummer, the last part of this Drake equation is L. Nice capital L. Carl Sagan represented it with a mushroom cloud when he did this because this is how long a civilization can last. You can do all of this. You can create life. You can create a radio. You can convince the darn politicians <laughs> to keep funding you. But if there is so much war that your civilization blows itself up, before you can communicate that out to the right planet. And if that civilization, AKA us, um, blows itself up before we have managed to listen to the right place, then it's all wasted. And so this equation condenses down to N equals L. So I'm gonna do that wonderful spherical cow thing of let's just make all of those things go away. All of those factors, we're kind of convinced what matters is can we survive long enough and can they survive long enough that our communications cross over? That only matters if we want to communicate with mm. them. Like they've only got to exist for 30 seconds and send the message for them to have existed. Yep. So L only matters if we want to talk to them. Yes. Doesn't it? Like it doesn't well, matter. Or, or if we want to have a really good chance of listening to them because yes, they might have only existed for 30 seconds to, to send this message, but we might have only listened to that planet at the wrong time. So we don't actually have the capability of listening to every single exoplanet that's in this, like we have a catalog of habitable exoplanets. Mm. <laughs> and what this Allen telescope array does is it turns all of its dishes and it listens for five minutes. And then it goes to the next one for five minutes and it repeats that catalog of 200 or something. And it's gonna do that for hundreds of years. If we've just looked away <laughs> when ET phone home, yeah. <laughs> you know, we've missed it. And, and so actually when you're thinking about this in terms of the probabilities of us being able to make contact, this civilization has to have been lasting a really long time and sending a really long time. But you're right, you can stop caring at any point in this. And the SETI Institute, it has hundreds of scientists on each of those things that only care if it develops life of any form, only care if they've got a bio signature or you know and it's only kind of the, the people that are really searching for extraterrestrial yeah. intelligence this is the key the, the s and the i are the key right it's the search and the intelligence that's when you need the whole equation so n in the drake equation as you've explained the drake equation with l included isn't the number of civilizations that are out there it's the number of civilizations out there that we're going to get to here. It's the contactable civilization. Contactable. It's here, fun. listen, yeah. listen toable. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it was Frank Drake's number plate until he died. Was was N E Q L L N equal L. <laughs> it was his number, and I have met three people with it tattooed on them that I know of. Uh, I've also met a couple with this tattooed on them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've not got any tattoos of it. Okay, <laughs> you've, you've taken away my next question. <laughs> Let, let me ask you this then, all right? We've talked about listening, eavesdropping, trying to hear a message. Another thing we obviously do is 
send messages. We've sent a couple of physical ones bolted onto yep, Voyager. Voyager and Voyager, things like that. Yep. Yep. But we've also, besides accidentally sending out I Love Lucy, we have deliberately sent out yep. messages. Your t-shirt. Yeah, so this is the only one that that has been sent out with any kind of real possibilities, I guess. This was the Drake message, so Frank Drake. He happens to be the director of a really big radio dish called Arecibo. He renovated it. And in 1974, he was like, oh, we need to make a big splash. What could we do? Ooh. And so what he did, it was he invited everybody. And he used this dish to send a really powerful radio signal in ones and zeros. And what this is, this is the base 10. So it's telling the civilization that we work in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in binary. That, oh my gosh, I think that's some of the chemical element, elements that create DNA. These are nucleotides. You've got a DNA helix here. You've got a little person just here. This is our radio dish, this is our acebo. Yeah, and you can you can look up what all of these things mean. I love the little person. Uh, this is the dimensions of a human. I believe it's in units of 21 centimeters, which is like a really common radio wavelength that hydrogen emits. And so everything's done in 21 centimeters because if you think we say, oh yeah, humans like 1.6 meters tall. What's a meter? Um, but everybody knows what the spin flip transition of hydrogen is. <laughs> That's 21 centimeters. So everything's done like a human's this many of that, and this, this size. Are you happy with that message? If you were the boss? I think it's nice and scientific. It's nice and calm. It's also, I think it's, it's never going to get heard because it was more of a publicity stunt. He sent it with huge power towards a specific galaxy. Um, but the problem is that that galaxy is so far away that by, by the time the message reaches it, it's actually going to have moved. <laughs> so it was very much a publicity stunt. But we've sent so many radio communications out. I'm kind of calm about sending more out because I think that they've heard us anyway, if they're out there. And also, as Frank Drake said, again, if he believed that extraterrestrials were able to visit Earth, he would have just got a deck chair, sat on his lawn and enjoyed the stars instead of going to all this effort to search. And when you go into the amount of energy it requires a civilization to, to visit another planet, it, it, it's huge. Like it takes the entire energy budget of a planet to kind of get it's just not going to happen. And why would they come? I mean, we, we're not great. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, uh, you, I'll, I'll finish with this then. I know you've read The Three-Body Problem. Yeah, and I've read The Three-Body yeah, Problem. Yeah. And anyone who's read that knows there is a suggestion that we shouldn't stick our head above the parapet. You should just keep quiet. Mm. In that book even, without spoiling it, you don't necessarily even have to be able to visit a planet or a place to know there's life there and dispatch of it, perhaps. Does that not scare you? Does that not make you think... We should, be, we should be shutting up. Oh, I'm just scared of everything. There's <laughs> so much to be scared of on our planet that I kind of, that's down the list <laughs> of the things. I mean, the three body problem, that is, there were so many copies on the bookshelf in the, uh, the Breakthrough Listen labs that I went to in Berkeley. It's all there, um, amazing. There are scientists, um, Stephen Hawking, for example, who have spoken out very loudly to say, my God, we need to be quiet because otherwise we're just advertising to the universe, come eat us, <laughs> we're here. Having read Frank Drake's take on it in his excellent book, um, I, I would say that it's, it's just so unlikely that they'd be able to visit and so unlikely that they'd want to take us over. Uh, I, just, I just can't see it, I just can't see it happening and maybe, Maybe it's just I'm too scared of climate change to worry about <laughs> the aliens at the minute. Um, I'm not sure, but I kind of see it as like, look, we, we, we've already done it. Yeah. It, it's and already out there. To, to kind of encapsulate the argument, as I understand it, though, the, the argument is like if you walked into a forest and every single creature and everyone was being absolutely quiet and you weren't hearing a peep and you walked into that forest, you might think, well, maybe I should be quiet too. Maybe there's a reason everyone here has been quiet. Uh, and definitely the third book of the third body problem um, definitely made me pause <laughs> in terms of, of, of that. I, and yeah, the idea is that you probably should be quiet, right? You should be cautious. But we can't st stop. For us to do that, I would have to ask you to not upload this to the internet. 
I would have to, because that, that's uploading. Dr. Chapman, who you just watched, runs a project for students about the science behind searching radio signals for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence. Find out more about studying at the University of Nottingham via the link in the video description. And stay tuned for the next 60 Symbols video, which will be all about biosignatures from the depths of space. There's something else you need to do, which is you need to convince yourself that whatever it is you're observing can't have happened through non-biological processes.